high-level and prominent uh, panelists, uh, Professor Dr. Enes Petric, who was our first ambassador to the United States. Uh, we have uh, Ambassador Daniel Fried, who was serving in many functions. He was assistant secretary uh, 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 at the time when Slovenia was joining the European Union. We have Ambassador Joseph Musumeli, Joe Musumeli, who was having a special uh, tenure in, in Slovenia. And uh, Professor Dr. Rupel, our first foreign minister, we hope he's going to join us uh, in a few minutes. Um, I will not be long. Uh, I will just say that in the particular, in the last period, uh, Slovenia and United States uh, deepened the dialogue. We have now uh, started and it's running for two years, uh, having a strategic dialogue. Just a few weeks ago, there was a strong US delegation in Slovenia. We are adding uh, the pillars to that dialogue, namely, uh, uh, cyber security, uh, digital technologies. Our Minister of Digital Transformation just visited United States. Uh, Slovenia will be opening the so-called tech, tech office uh, in Silicon Valley. So in all uh, levels, uh, the relations are actually deepening. And that, thanks to the really strong fundament, we are also having uh, 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 very strong cooperation in the multilateral uh, field. Slovenia is running now for the non-permanent uh, seat in the Security Council. And our friendship, I have to say, it's becoming uh, really strong and mature. Today, uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, President of the Republic of Slovenia is marking a special event, uh, a day of friendship between Slovenians and Americans. So me as an ambassador, I can only say that I'm really happy. I would be even more happy if those atrocities and terrible things wouldn't be happening in Ukraine, but we are here uh, to, to help each other and to defend uh, democracy and to work uh, to work for the common good. I'm going to stop now because it's already 9.05 and I will ask uh, our foreign minister, uh, Dr. Angel Loger, who is today attending the NATO ministerial in Brussels uh, to say uh, a welcoming address. It's pre-recorded and then uh, director of the European uh, Center for European Perspective, uh, Ms. Gershak will take over. Thank you very much for being with us. Ambassador, panelists, guests, it is a special honor for me to address you at this event, marking the 30th anniversary of the US recognition of Slovenian independence and the 30th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between the two countries. As experts on our bilateral relations and on that period in time, your panelists will insightfully present the events that led to the recognition of Slovenia. Recognition of our independence did not come easy, but our American friends were ultimately convinced by our determination to build a democratic and prosperous European country with strong transatlantic orientation. Our community in the United States also played a role. After Slovenia's accession to NATO and the EU, relations between our two countries have gained more layers and breadth. By joining the EU, Slovenia has entered a new dimension of the transatlantic family, which is strongly connected to the same principles and values. By joining NATO, Slovenia has joined the United States and other partners in the Defense Alliance. The EU and NATO remain essential elements of our relationship today. We have proved ourselves as one of the most successful economies of the Central Europe and as a reliable partner in the international community, not least by already two presidencies of the European Union and the span in the United Nations Security Council. We are currently witnessing events that pose the greatest threat to European security since World War II. We are looking at an attempt by an illiberal regime to change borders, occupy a sovereign country, and deprive its people of their rights to decide how they want to live, subjugate them, and mold by force the country in its own image. There are very few good stories in times like this. However, one of them is that the global West, be it NATO, the EU and the United States, and our partners in Asia Pacific is more united than ever. This unified stand brings important strength at the time when our principles and values of democracy, human rights, free market economy, and the rule-based international order are at stake. This is particularly important for us in Central Europe at NATO's eastern flank, 
Consequently, I'm optimistic about the future of our relationship, both bilateral and transatlantic. Slovenia and the US continue their intensive contacts at all levels, including my meeting with the Secretary of State Blinken in December. We held substantive political and security consultations and conducted the first consultation on cybersecurity. Just this past March in Ljubljana, we held the second strategic dialogue, which is to become an important platform for discussion about bilateral and wider strategic and security issues. What I would like to see in the future is continued and enhanced partnership, friendship and cooperation marked by strong people-to-people -people contacts. This make a relationship stronger and more durable. In particular, we should take much bolder steps when it comes to new economic and trade opportunities, including the fields of energy, services, dig digitalization, artificial intelligence, and advanced technology. Only strong and resilient will we be able to help and inspire others. We must be the defenders of the rule-based international order and democracy globally. Every day we prove that our ties run deep as they are rooted in history and based on the same values. And we know that they are worth fighting for. Thank you for your attention and I wish you a very good conversation. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador for the introduction. Um, and we thank the minister for his message. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speakers, dear guests, welcome to today's debate. First, I would like to commend the Slovenian Embassy in Washington DC for organizing this event. And I would like to warmly thank our distinguished panelists for taking the time to be here with us today. We're marking 30 years of relations between US and Slovenia, and it is, I think, time to look back, but also a time to act in light of turbulence uh, on the global stage. I think Russian aggression in Ukraine is a stark reminder that values matter. And not only that, that they come above everything else. And in light of this, it is also important to reflect on our partnership that developed based on these values and to look for opportunities to strengthen it. Um, I believe it is crucial that we now enhance our cooperation as well as our capacities, uh, capacities of the NATO Alliance and invest with the aim of preserving the international rules-based order. Now, beyond NATO, of course, our relations span across a no number of other important areas from economic to cultural to combating climate change. And um, some would note that there's a vast difference in size and capacities of our respective countries. But I would say this does not in any way diminish the substance of our partnerships and the value behind it. Uh, to reflect on these topics, it is my distinct honor uh, to have the, the, the panelists with us here today. I would like to thank the ambassador for presenting them already. Um, and with uh, that said, we can dive right into the debate. Uh, Dr. Petric, as the first ambassador of Slovenia to the United States, uh, how would you characterize the early days or rather, which do you believe are the most momentous events in this partnership at the time? Well, thank you, uh, Madame Gershak. Let me first say, I thank to all who have organized this very important meeting. And I'm also very glad to see some of my old friends here. And also I am glad that you, by this event, make me to recall those days, which were, I would say somehow the best days of my life. Although practically it was tough to start our mission in Washington, we haven't been recognized. We had no diplomatic relations yet till the day of today, 30 years ago. But there was a feeling that we are finally building our own state, that we have met the historic opportunity to become an independent nation, that we are working for that, I must say, in spite of all the practical, pragmatic troubles which were there, we had no credit cards, we have no this, we have no that, and so on. Everything, we had just a room, and the room in a hotel, that was all we started with. But the feeling that we are doing something very important was there. And I will say only a word which I th think is important. Very important thing was that I felt from the very moment when I was appointed to go to United States, to Washington, 
as a representative of the new state without diplomatic relations, of course, in autumn 91, after meetings with the then US ambassador to Yugoslavia, Warren Zimmerman, and later when I came to Washington, from the very first day I felt that we are welcome there, that we enjoy American support. Sometimes in Slovenia, one could hear America was opposing our independence. Not at all, not at all, but as a serious state, they had to be cautious. They had to have in mind the broader picture and so on, but Slovenia, and they believed it will be a new democracy, enjoyed their support and I felt it personally because the access to State Department, to National Security uh, Council and so on, and to other offices in the United States and a lot of pragmatic support, it was all there from the first day I arrived to Washington. So maybe it's very late now, but let me also express my personal grat gratitude that in those days, which were so great, but at the same time, very difficult for me and my family, that we enjoyed such a support of the people and of the organs and of the state, of the government of the United States. Uh, well, then we started the journey, developing the relations, but that is already the second part of the topic, I believe, so I will stop here. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the, I'm sorry, I, I am unmuted, right? Yes, yes. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, for the opening remarks, uh, Dr. Petric. Ambassador Fried, when you look back at the 30 years perspective, what would you highlight as the core of this relationship and which over the years has turned into this long lasting partnership? Slovenia made the crucial strategic decision to join the European mainstream. It made the decision to leave the wreck and ruin of former Yugoslavia. During the Yugoslav days, um, the 1980s, when I served in the US embassy in Belgrade, I visited Slovenia and Slovenes had two views. One was they wanted to reform Yugoslavia to make it a more modern European country. They tried and they failed. The second view is, was we, Slovenia, want to turn our backs on the nationalist politics that is animating Belgrade, increasingly animating Belgrade, and become a European mainstream country, true to our historic roots. This is what you heard. And the Slovenes did it. I mean, they didn't just talk about it, they actually did it. And it might have been otherwise. It might have been otherwise. Serbia now cannot seem to escape the trauma of the breakup of Yugoslavia for which Serbian nationalism was largely, if not entirely responsible, wasn't entirely responsible, but it was the crucial factor in the, in the Yugoslav civil wars. And Serbia cannot to this day escape it. They cannot fully own up to their responsibility or the responsibility for tolerating Serbian nationalist extremists. But Slovenia has walked, pulled itself toward Europe. That is a big deal. And I remember Ernst Petrich in the 90s who insisted that the US look at Slovenia as a former communist country seeking to join the European institutions in an undivided Europe. He was strong and consistent about that and ultimately successful. So this is a big deal. We see what happens when countries cannot deal with the past. Russia, after having tried in the 90s inconsistently, but sometimes earnestly, to find a European path for itself has given up. And if you read the current official Russian press, you realize that they have gone something close to enthusiastically fascist. And I don't use that word lightly, but read the 
read some of the articles being published by RIA.ru. They've gone to the dark side of their past. Slovenia chose otherwise. And what I would like to see is Slovenia's voice raised on behalf of the United Europe that to which it has contributed and is contributing. And the defense of that United Europe from dangers both from Russia and frankly in the Balkans, dangers from Serbia, which occasionally flirts with, and not just occasionally, flirts with the nationalist agenda in Bosnia and toward Kosovo and in Montenegro. Serbia would be better advised to choose Europe. And after Putin's war against Ukraine, it will be harder for the Serbian leadership to have a foot in both camps. Slovenia, I, I welcome what Slovenia has done. So thank you, Ambassador Kaiser, for, for organizing this session. It's great to see Slovenia's progress. I wish the circumstances were better, but Slovenia has done its part, and thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. As you so eloquently pointed out, Ambassador Fried, the decision, it was a decision to walk towards democracy that we've taken. And uh, since then, I think we've shared common values and commitment to multilateralism and international law. And that's the core of the partnership. Ambassador Musameli, you served in Slovenia from 2010. And the bilateral relations at that time were already multi-layered and encompassed a variety of areas. What did you see as the main strengths and opportunities? And at the same time, what do you see as the key challenges? Yeah, um, you know, I came late to this party of um, Yugoslav breaking up and um, Slovenia becoming part of the West. So I feel inadequate to talk about the early days like uh, Ambassadors Petrich and Fried did. But I, I can tell you for my four or so years in Slovenia, there's a lot of, and I mean this mostly as praise and not criticism, but for such a small country, Slovenia has many um, contradictions within it. For one thing, no matter what government you have in place, whether it's to the left or to the right, they're always a very reliable ally. They're always consistent in pushing for democracy, pushing for free enterprise, pushing for inclusion. Um, but on the person to person level, there's always this undercurrent in Slovenia. Uh, Ambassador Fried mentions that they chose to turn away from that Yugoslav past and move toward uh, the unity of Europe. But at the same time, there's this, I wouldn't say it's a negative undercurrent, but there's a certain suspicion of the West still among a certain um, group within Slovenia. There's a certain distrust or even disdain of America um, that, that you have to accept as part of the Slovene um, society, all very, polite and all very civil in their discourse. But, there, but we, would, we would be remiss if we just thought this was, um, there was a broad consensus among all Slovenes that America is always right or NATO is always right. Uh, sort of like in Italy right now, there, there's considerable sympathy for Russia still in Slovenia. There's, there's always been during my time there, even though um, uniformly, whether I talked to people on the left or the right or anywhere else, there was always a civility in how they discussed things with me. There was this sense that um, they weren't quite sure that they had made the, at least among some of them, that they had made the right decision in moving so quickly and so um, certainly to uh, NATO and the EU. You may remember from the referendum itself that the vote for EU membership was much more significant than it was for NATO. So even as we build up our relationship, as we and 
honest, I have to say this again, every government I worked with, and I think there were four or five in those four years, they were all very reliable in the bilateral relationship. There was always, there are always those um, in Slovenia who are not quite content with how things are now. Thank you so much for, for the frankness and for um, highlighting this. I would like to pass it back to uh, Dr. Petric. And um, uh, I, I would, Dr. Petric, I would ask you, what, what, what would you, your reaction be to the, uh, to the topic that um, uh, Ambassador Musameli mentioned, the contradictions within Slovenian society? And also, how do you think uh, this is going to be reflected now in light of the uh, Russian aggression in Ukraine? Um, how do you see the whole security situation in which Slovenia finds itself? Well, Slovenia, like any country, is of course a pluralistic country. In Slovenia, there are also, of course, it's not so long ago, from the times when many people really believed that our allies are east from us, people who believed in the non-alignment and so on, and it was not so easy then that we would be so unanimous in accepting the new ties, the new times. But basically, I think there was no serious opposition in majority of Slovenian people that our future lies together with European countries, EU, and also that our security is best served by membership of NATO. In this context of European situ situation right now, of course, there are some thinkings which are result of, I would say, not much thinking, but more of some feelings. But I think that even in Slovenia, which is many times divided, it's, it's uh, public opinion, it's media and so on. It is the understanding that we are facing in Europe now an aggression an aggression which is according not only to international law, a crime. In many documents, I will not cite them, it is quite clear, aggression is one of the four crimes under international law. Genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and aggression. But even in Slovenian penal court, like in penal courts of many other countries, Article 103, is describing aggression exactly as a case of use of armed force of one state against the other to subdue it, to dismember it, to put it under influence and so on. That states as a crime in our penal court and it is considered to be a serious crime because the minimum penalty is 15 years of prison. Uh, but of course, you know, many people lived these last 30 years in Slovenia and also in Europe in a kind of comfortable time. We didn't really very much pay attention to some things which were taking place. And then suddenly we realized that we are facing a serious danger to the basic principles of contemporary international order. An order which is based on prevention of use of armed force, except two exceptions, self-defense and armed force used under the orders, under the leadership of Security Council of the United Nations. This has happened and it will have an impact on the future relations on our continent, but also throughout the world. But the positive side of this is, and I think it was already mentioned by Dan Fried, that somehow it contributed to unity of European Union, to unity within the NATO, and that we really, really realize that the life, international life nowadays, it's not only nice and sweet music, but there are also challenges and one of them is some ideas, some ambitions, one of them we are facing now in Ukraine. 
The situation which we are facing is also very terrible because of the fact that usually aggression is accompanied by other crimes, massacres and other crimes, which we see lately are also happening in Ukraine. It is very difficult to predict how to get out of it, but according to me, we should by no means accept a kind of fait accompli. We should never accept that aggression can bring some final positive results to anybody, but at the same time, we should be very cautious and very wise to avoid any actions and situation which might, which might lead us to a larger war, which would be a challenge actually to existence of our civilization. That we can do when we are working together. And the last thing which I want to say, it proved again that besides all talks, the fact is that our security depends to a large, large extent on the support of United States of America. We, I believe, are now aware again that we have to stand together, something which I believe also Slovenian foreign policy is committed to achieve. Unity, cooperation in all fields, according to our values, according to our interests, with our great ally on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, thank you, Dr. Petric. And while we continue with this very interesting debate, I just wanted to note that we're very sorry that we're having technical difficulties with uh, Dr. Rupel joining this debate. We really hope that we can resolve them. Uh, we're working on that um, uh, because it would be valuable to have his input, of course. And uh, uh, secondly, I would like to uh, call on our dear guests uh, that are participating here today, uh, but cannot be seen on the screen, uh, to share your comments and, and most um, and your questions in particular, um, either on the chat or on the Q&A. Uh, we would, of course, be very happy, the panelists would be very happy to address them. Uh, now, moving on, I think this is... Um, uh, a very a number of very important points that Dr. Petrich made. Um, Ambassador Fried, I would pass it on to you. How do you see, in light of the Russian aggression, um, the Ukraine basically changing Europe and the world order? Where do you see this going? Please unmute yourself, sir. Excuse me. Russia's aggression against Ukraine is the number one security challenge Europe faces. It is the largest war in Europe since the end of World War II. It is much bigger in scale than the Yugoslav wars, though it bears a certain resemblance in terms of the brutality, the extreme nationalism, the, the killing of civilians, all in the name of nationalism. I want to link this issue to what Ambassador Musamelli said about Slovenia's ambivalence. And it is reminiscent sometimes of a kind of Austrian or Hungarian sense that the problems of European security have little to do with them that they can live their happy life as consumers of the benefits of a united Europe and with a kind of disdain for the Americans who with all our faults and we have many and all our mistakes and we have committed a number are still the principal authors and guarantors of the system which benefits Slovenia. Putin in his war against Ukraine is challenging the system. He has contempt for it. He believes that might makes right, that values are nonsense. The democratic aspirations of the Ukrainian people and their desire to join Europe, not dissimilar from the desire of many Slovenians, not all, but many Slovenians are inauthentic, and in fact, must be manipulated, you know, by the CIA or something, British intelligence, Polish intelligence, 
the usual Kremlin nonsense. Those who think Putin's aggression has nothing to do with them may discover and should discover their error. It has a lot to do with them. The United Europe that has benefited Slovenia so much is under attack. Putin wants to return us to a period of great power spheres of influence, of domination by the strong over the weak. A European, an ugly European system, which repudiates the European enlightenment and all of the progress we thought we had made, however flawed. So I would say we all have a stake in this, in defeating Putin's aggression and in particular helping the Ukrainians fight for their freedom because they are fighting also, as they say, for a set of values. And they're fighting for those values because that, that also constitutes protection for them. That is the core of President Zelensky's case. His case to the UN Security Council yesterday, his case to NATO, his case to the EU, his case to us all. That was also Slovenia's case. It's easy for Slovenes to take for granted and, and look with disdain at the many inconsistencies of a United Europe or American support for a United Europe. But Putin's attack on Ukraine, the mass murder of civilians, the shelling and rocket attacks on cities, the millions of refugees. This should remind us that peace in Europe is like good health. You miss it only when it's gone. So I want to be able to work with Slovenia in common purpose. We'll talk about the Three Seas Initiative and Slovenia has hosted an important summit. So that's what's at stake. And to what does Slovenia owe its independence? Slovenia in 91, 92 and afterwards appealed to Europe also in the name of universal values, not in the name of narrow mercantile interests. And Slovenia was right. Slovenia was right. And we listen. Ernst Petrich was particularly strong in, that, in making that case and good for him. So take a look at Ukraine. I would say this to Slovenians, look what Putin is doing in Ukraine and consider that that could have been you. Had, had Serbia been stronger and more successful. I'll let that thought hang. Anyway, looking forward to, the, to more of the discussion. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that was um, quite an interesting thought at the end. Uh, and I think it would actually even deserve a bit of silence to contemplate. Uh, but moving on, Ambassador Musumeli, I, I saw you nodding your head a couple of times, and I'm sure um, I would really like to hear your point of view on, on all these topics from European Security, Transatlantic Alliance. Well, we now are seeing a definite split and formation of sides. Um, and do you believe this will mark the next decade or two to come? I wish I knew for sure what the next decade is going to be. Um, I, I hadn't thought of Ambassador Fried's analogy of Serbia to the rest of Yugos, former Yugoslavia. It's a very good one that um, in different circumstances, it could have been a miniature replay of or foreshadowing of what's happening now between Ukraine and Russia. The only thing I really, I, I think that and this is probably opening up a terrible can of worms. I, I feel that in the 90s as, as, a, as a community, 
we share part of the blame for not when we had the possibility of Russian leaders who were less extreme and less um, paranoid as Putin is to have brought Russia further along into the European fold. I, it's too long ago now, and there were certainly mistakes made on both sides. But it's unfortunate that um, increasingly over the decades, Russia became more and more paranoid and more and more aggressive and nationalistic since the fall of the, um, their empire. Uh, how we go proceed from that now, I don't know. I, I, nobody is certain. I, I think that the paranoia is so great, the, regardless of the reality, I think the, many Russians feel that they are th faced with an existential threat, even though it, it's ludicrous for them to think so. Um, that it's going to be very hard for them to relent. And on the other hand, the Ukrainians are showing that their, their tenacity and resilience is something that is not going to be easily crushed. To find some sort of way out of this is, honestly, I don't know what that could be. Um, um... Okay, uh, sorry, I'm also having technical issues with the unmuting. Uh, Dr. Petrich, uh, I wanted to come back to you and point out that in when you were in um, discussing uh, the aggression on Ukraine, you also pointed out that one of the outcomes is unity that we're seeing in the EU and NATO. Um, however, I, I cannot go past the point that we do have a tendency in Slovenia of, of taking our security for granted as Ambassador Fried uh, pointed out. Um, do you think this unity is then likely to remain? How do you think the situation is going to impact on us? It is very difficult to predict, but I, I'm pretty sure that many people are not aware that after this aggression, we are entering a new phase in international life in international order in Europe and around the world. Things will not be as comfortable as they have been in the past. How to achieve first a kind of peace. And after that also, we should not simply forget about the justice. Because if we forget about the justice, then we are really risking to establish a new international order in which the powerful could be rewarded by using aggression as a mean of their policy. That would also be a kind of end of international order. So again, as I said before, we have to find a kind of right balance, not to accept it, but at the same time to avoid a hot war, a cold war, a kind of new cold war, I believe we cannot avoid. It will not be the same as it was the Cold War in the past. But if when I look at all those breaking relations between Russia and the West European Union, even leaving or being expelled, but being isolated from the Council of Europe, European Court on Human Rights, Russia-NATO cooperation, cooperation in the space, et cetera, et cetera, not to speak of other things. This will harm the way we live and it will harm also the international, the international order. Now, to, to me, it seems extremely important that finally, by all means, we persist on our basic values. The most difficult thing and the most tragic thing, according to me, is also that Russia will be again isolated from the West, isolated from Europe, from European values, as it was for three generations during Stalinist times. It seems that this one or two generations of new cutting off Russia from the West, although Russia is basically according to its past, 
a specific country, but basically a European country, that that is an, in a way a very tragic development for the Russian people them, in particular. On the horizon, there are great challenges. They are not only the Russian Federation and the United States and the European Union big powers, there are also other big powers whose reaction will be very interesting to see in the future months, years. But when I look at that, one can, feel, can have a feeling that this great idea by Francis Fukuyama, that the kind of history of confrontation and so on is all over, that that is a matter of past. We will live in a more dangerous, in a more challenging world in the future decades. Um, thank you very much. And now not to leave it on such a, a bleak note, although I, I, I do very much agree with you, unfortunately, um, I think we should touch a little bit on the multilateral cooperation, which is, of course, very crucial for preserving the international rules-based order. And I think we, need, we can highlight some other areas of cooperation um, between U.S. and Slovenia in various international institutions, such as the U.N., OSCE, OECD. Um, we also need to note that Slovenia announced its candidature for the non a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Um, I would like to, Ambassador Fried, ask you, would you um, highlight where you see the future of our and how you see the future of our cooperation also within the uh, Three Seas Initiative, which uh, also came from the uh, very strongly supported by the Atlantic Council, where you're also a distinguished fellow. Well, the Three Seas Initiative is an idea that made sense even before Putin's war against Ukraine. And it seems more urgent now. The Three Seas Initiative is basically, an, it was an idea of the Croats, Poles, Romanians, and some of the Atlantic Council to focus investment in infrastructure to link the, the countries east of the old Iron Curtain line between the Baltic Blacks and Adriatic Seas, which infrastructure which had been neglected by the Soviet Union and the communist governments, which focused on east-west transit, but nothing north-south. The idea is to work with the EU to supplement EU efforts to strengthen energy, high-tech, and other transportation infrastructure. Now, in light of Putin's war against Ukraine, this makes sense as an urgent project. Putin is going to put pressure on all of Central and Eastern Europe. Europe, particularly Central and Eastern Europe, needs to lower its dependence on Russian gas. Energy infrastructure, LNG terminals, secondary pipelines, green energy sources, all, all commercially viable, need funding. The Three Seas Initiative is supposed to fun focus efforts to develop regional projects. That's the idea. Slovenia hosted a Three Seas Summit. I attended, that was the last time I was in Slovenia. And to work, the Three Seas Summit has to be EU friendly. There has to be EU buy-in. We also need to think of Ukraine's role because there will come a time after the war for massive reconstruction. And it makes sense to integrate Ukraine into Europe as the Ukrainians want and as the Europeans say they want. And I believe them. So this is one area where Slovenia would be both a beneficiary, so its national interest is advanced by the Three Seas Initiative and could show, could participate in a re regional project and show as much leadership as it cares to. And I would welcome it. Uh, yeah, I have to say I'm, I'm proud that SAFE was a co-organizer of the business part of the Three Seas Summit uh, that was held in Ljubljana. Um, and also uh, to note uh, 
that uh, the Three Seas Initiative is now developing very well across Europe. The um, next summit is also going to include the civil societies, organizations uh, that are now linked uh, from these countries and uh, CEP is then very strongly supporting that as well. So uh, we're very happy that, that the initiative is moving forward the way it is and we're we hope that it also has uh, some very clear benefits for our infrastructure and digital uh, project as well. Um, now, um, Ambassador uh, Musomeli, you were you were here for a number of years, uh, as we know, and so you've had the insight of a number of areas, um, from bilateral to to multilateral, with, between the U.S. and Slovenian partnership. Where do you see space for growth, um, despite of the fact that you may not have been on the ground for a while? However, there are strategic issues. There are issues that um, that. Uh, uh, that span across time, so to speak. So I'm sure you would have a valuable perspective on that. I'm not sure how valuable it is, but I do have a perspective. Um, I, I think that given its size, Slovenia is, and given its socialist past, Slovenia is an extraordinarily entrepreneurial and innovative country. Um, it, it, it's, it always strikes me uh, quite, how remarkable the Slovene people are and how in business and science and technology, they really um, are, are it, it's inconceivable if you just, not to berate my own country, but if you just took 2 million random Americans and put them against the 2 million Slovenes, I don't think we could compete. It's it, the, the Slovenes are way ahead of us person for person in that regard. So I think that there's a lot more to be done on technology and business in general, despite the, the polling of the past of socialism. You, you do still have that dichotomy in your country, but um, I think we could do much more. Also, you had mentioned on a completely different matter on the UN Security Council. I have to say, I, I was, I think that Slovenia would be an ideal candidate from the American perspective in that you have to get buy-in from all five um, permanent members for that. And I, I think Slovenia, actually it's, it's ambivalence sometimes is, uh, is actually marketable in this regard because the Russians and the Chinese will probably look upon Slovenia as less of a um, adversary as some of the other candidates. And at the same time, Slovenia is extraordinarily reliable and trustworthy to the Americans and the other um, permanent members. So I'm hopeful actually that you guys succeed in this. It, it would be a great benefit for the United Nations. And it, it's something that I think Slovenia could do very well. Um, thank you very much for this very valuable perspective. Uh, Dr. Petrich, I would like to come back to you and I, I hope that you can um, highlight a couple of things about the multilateral cooperation, uh, uh, particularly discuss the candidature for the non-permanent member um, of the UN Security Council, as well as what's your view, where um, are the uh, opportunities for growth and further strengthening of the US-Slovenian relations? I mean, we've seen the US uh, relations, Slovenian relations picked up pace in the last two years, if, if I dare to say that. So the state secretary's visit in Slovenia in August in uh, 2020, then Minister Logar visit to the US uh, to officially launch the strategic dialogue at the end of the same year. Um, and there was uh, an absence of these bilateral visits in the past few years before that, which which kind of became quite noticeable. So uh, do we see this as a reinvigorated effort to enhance our partnership? Uh, I think uh, that our relations with United States are now compared to the decades in the past, very productive, a lot of cooperation in all fields. And it is in a way difficult to invent just like that, some new field of important cooperation. I think we would, we should continue with all these aspects of our cooperation, which are going on now. To, to me, it seems very important to have this strategic dialogue because strategic problems in Europe and in the world will, will have much more importance 
in the future than maybe had in the past. We are facing great, great challenges, which we somehow were in a way aware, but not quite aware a year ago that we might meet them, those challenges. Uh, it was mentioned before the six, uh, the three C's initiative. I think it is a very important initiative. It has, I would say, geopolitical importance. Mm -hmm. Yes, establishing linkage infrastructure, north south in this area, which we are missing and so on, but also in a way to show that this part, Central and Eastern Europe, Ukraine and uh, Romania and so on, that this part of the, of the world and of Europe has also some specific interests which should be promoted with an ambition, with an ambition cooperation. As concerned the Security Council membership, I think Slovenia would play there, could play there an important role. Of course, I was in the Ministry of Slovenia at that time when we have been members of Security Council in the past. And I have learned at that time certain interesting things. For instance, that the big powers, in particular to the big powers at that time, they were, of course, not very much interested in our views, but they are very much interested in our vote. So we have been sometimes pressed by two sides, and it will also be in the future. But it doesn't matter. It is the reality of life, the reality of international life, and with a wise policy and sticking with the principles which we pursue, you can make it and you can contribute you can contribute to the work of Security Council. Well, I have a feeling that also on the work of Security Council, also on the whole system of United Nations, this crisis which we are facing now will have an impact, will, will have an impact. For Slovenia, it will be a great challenge, the election. And then if we are elected to perform in the Security Council, as a, as a factor, as an actor in pursuing peace and security. It is another question which I would just like to mention. In the last 30 years, the idea of a kind of reform of United Nations and in particularly the reform of composition and of functioning of the Security Council has somehow the interest for this reform has somehow withered away. Probably or possibly it may increase now again because it is again and again proved that in particularly the use of veto by one of the permanent members when their interests are a matter of discussion in the Security Council is maybe something which should be not abolished, but limited in certain ways. Anyhow, I am proud to say that Slovenia has in these 30 years of its existence, being small, but nevertheless, we have somehow proved that we can function as a normal state in, a, in the international community and that we can challenge all the, uh, and that we can meet all the challenges which might which might appear. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Petric, for this comprehensive answer. Um, we were unable to, unfortunately, unable to resolve the technical issues we had with Dr. Rupert joining. However, um, we're very keen on getting his perspective. So we are actually switching him um, into the discussion, including him into the discussion through the phone. So using all the possible technical means in order to uh, get his opinion. Uh, Dr. Rupert, thank you so much for being with us. Um, you played a very key role in the initial steps taking and establishing diplomatic relations uh, between Slovenia and the United States. Um, I would like to first, uh, in, in a couple of minutes, just kindly ask you to briefly share the sentiment that existed at that time and your personal perspective on this. And then perhaps we can move on uh, with the next question and the challenges and the opportunities you see currently in the US 
um, Slovenian relations. Yes, sir. Now, uh, as you know, Slovenia has been a special case um, uh, during, uh, during the Yugoslav crisis, and Slovenia was uh, an easy case, so to say, so the European Union could uh, resolve the problem relatively easily, relatively, I say. We, we have some, some hostilities, we have a war, but still the European Union um, at the meeting at the only, uh, helped us to resolve the problem. Now, uh, America has to step in um, with, in connection with, with the crisis in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in, in, in Kosovo, and so on and so on. Now, um, since Slovenia was already out of the crisis, so to say, um, we, of course, were, were working towards uh, international recognition. One of the countries that was addressed to, to help us here was the United States of America. I remember traveling to the United States quite, quite a few times. At that time, uh, Secretary of State was uh, Lawrence Siegelberger. And I, I, I'm proud to say that um, he was a friend, but of course, a reserved friend. Now, he, he explained to me that the United States wanted to uh, to find a solution for the whole Yugoslav problem, so to say, and, well, they, they added Slovenia to the Yugoslav problem. But um, sometime in March, if I'm not mistaken, we, we met again, and he said, now we, we may be ready, um, we shall recognize you um, at the end of March or the beginning of April. And uh, I said, well, if, if this is the case, why don't you recognize Slovenia uh, on the 7th of April, which is uh, the date of my birthday. And um, he never said, why not? So that was the beginning of our relations, uh, which, uh, which um, were developing quite fast. At the beginning of 92, I already was um, in the Oval Office of uh, the White House, together with uh, Ernest Pepich, who was ambassador at that time. Uh, we spoke to um, uh, American, then American President, President um, George Bush, senior, of course, uh, and um, I, I had the opportunity to um, uh, des describe the situation of Sarajevo. I just came from Sarajevo, and my American, um, well, uh, the, the American listeners uh, were, were um, eager to, to hear about uh, whatever I had to say. So this was a very important meeting. But then, you know, uh, one of one of the issues that Slovenia was very much interested in was uh, joining NATO. And of course, we knew that uh, America would be would be the decisive factor here. And um, uh, well, uh, we we were not successful uh, at the first shot uh, with the first shot. But but um, uh, I think that. Uh, President Clinton, in 1998, when, when uh, the Prime Minister of America, I visited him, um, he, he changed his mind and he even said that he would try to, to um, uh, add Slovenia to the group of the three new NATO members, Czech, Czech Republic, um, Hungary, and Poland. Now, this was possible, and so some of our Slovenian politicians were very, very um, happy because it, um, many of them didn't want to join NATO, but I and some of the notion wanted to join NATO anyway. And majority of Slovenian Slovenian people also. So this was one issue which was resolved when 
with uh, President Bush Jr. Um, it was it was resolved after the uh, September 11 crisis, and then uh, quite a number of, of Eastern European and Central European countries could join. Um, I'm I'm still proud of this. Um, we had the referendum in Slovenia, and it was a it was a smashing success. Uh, Two thirds of uh, of the of the uh, voters voted for for joining NATO. Um, some of some of our other parties were unhappy, but I was quite happy. Uh, later, um, our relations with with the uh, United States uh, developed very well. Uh, as you know, George Bush even uh, even tried to to look straight into the eyes of uh, Vladimir Putin at Berba Castle uh, in Slovenia. Um, that was in 2001. It was really a very good day for, for Slovenia, hosting such an important uh, meeting. And uh, again, you know, um, the government led by, by uh, Prime Minister Denosha and Prime Minister Jansha were very much pro-American to be, to be quite short and not to lose too much time. Now, in 2008, uh, George Bush uh, came to uh, Slovenia again. And at that time, Slovenia was uh, in charge of uh, the presidency of the European Council. And we were sort of, um, how should I say, representing Europe um, in front of the United States. And that was, that was quite an interesting, uh, interesting um, uh, occasion. Um, Afterwards, after the after the um, uh, demise of the Yansha government in uh, 2008, after the new government came in, uh, the interest of Slovenian politicians somehow um, well slept, uh, became became sleepy, so to say, and um, our politicians, primarily the politicians of the left orientation were uh, more interested in the relation, in good relations with Moscow. So one of our foreign ministers, one of my successors, unfortunately, visited Moscow quite often and never visited Washington. That was that was the bad the bad moment. Then um, after after the beginning of Yansha's government again in uh, 2020, relations uh, improved dramatically. And I guess that um, also this this uh, well this occasion this conversation is part of of a sign or a proof if you want of good relations between our two countries. I'm extremely happy to 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 see um, Dan Fried, who helped to me a lot during um, our presidency, my chairmanship of the OSD in 2005, um, and I'm also glad to to. Um, to find out that uh, Nathan Mussolini uh, would take part in, in this, in this um, well, conversation. Um, he, is, he used to be a very popular ambassador, and, um, well, I like him very much, and, and um, I'm so sorry that um, uh, his successes were not as successful as he was uh, in, in establishing, I would say, Direct and, and friendly relations between our two countries, but of course, you know, the winners of small country. Um, I, I remember one one conversation with uh, a former uh, national security advisor, Jezinski, uh, when I tried to persuade him that Slovenia deserves to join NATO. He said, "Well, if we need Slovenia, we, we just occupy you," um, meaning that that. Um, Actually, there would be no great profit from having Slovenia inside. Well, Americans, after studying the case, uh, later found some, some uh, advantages of uh, working with Slovenia, and Slovenians, of course, uh, became quite, quite eager to, to work with Americans, mm -hmm. and I hope that um, this, this uh, cooperation will continue mm -hmm. um, happily.
Thank you, Dr. Rupert. We're very happy uh, that you were able to share with us um, this comprehensive overview. And I would uh, actually, we're a bit stretched for time at this point. Uh, and for that matter, I would like uh, each panelist to have a, a concluding thought. And that would really be a sentence on two uh, on how, uh, what do you think is the priority? How do you see the relations Slovenian um, American going forward? Um, what, what are the key things that you think about. I know I'm setting up uh, this as a very broad question, uh, but Dr. Rupert, I will, I will uh, pose it to you first, but the, a very brief thought of what you think is the core and where do you think we need to go from here? Well, you know, um, foreign policy, uh, you know, um, thinking at this point, it depends very much on the situation in Ukraine and uh, the situation, the relationship between uh, the West and peace. We are, we are very, very unhappy about what happened in Ukraine. And here, the Union is part of Central Europe. And Americans, I think, should, I hope they will, consider Central Europe as, as a bridge, as a, as a helper, as, as a, you know, uh, an advisor, how to cope with the problem of uh, former communist countries and um, of course also Russia and Ukraine and so on. Now I think that we have a lot of knowledge, a lot of expertise in, in analyzing and finding solutions to the problems of former communist system. So um, I, I, well, I expect to, to uh, sh shall I say, we should be prepared to give our American friends advice. One of one of the you know one of the things that I'm I'm doing at this point is I'm here at the meeting of Central European um, intellectuals here in Prague, and actually we are all very much concerned about the Ukrainian situation, and we would like to help. We would like to establish a block of of this how shall I say bridge making countries between the West and and the East. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rupert. It is great to have you with us. Um, um, Ambassador Fried, your concluding thought, if I may. As usual, I find myself in agreement with, Ambas with Minister Rupert. Let's build on what we started. Let's build on the foundation we started with in the 90s. That is, both Slovenia and the United States benefit from a united Europe, from an integrated Europe, from an undivided Europe. So let's work together to see if we can help the Ukrainians defeat Putin's aggression and strengthen Europe and then strengthen the, the transatlantic alliance in economic terms so that we can deal with the different threats from Russia and the challenges from China. Let's bring the chief democracy, the chief, the world's chief centers of democracy to, together to work on a common agenda. And let's remember that our national interests advance if we think of them in the broadest possible terms, not narrow terms. And that's directed against every country. We're all tempted by a narrow vision of our national interests, and it's usually a mistake. So this is a great session. I hope it points a good, to a good way forward. Thank you very much. Ambassador Musumeli, go ahead. Let's see. Yeah, let me look at it from a different perspective, a more narrow one. I agree with what uh, the, the other folks have said, but just looking at America and Slovenia in a bilateral sense, I would add that, um, while I've met many Slovenes who disagreed with our policy sometimes and our government often, I never met a Slovene who didn't like Americans and American culture, American music, American art, um, whatever came from America. So I'm very hopeful and optimistic about our future bilateral relationship, simply because even if we disagree on politics sometimes, the 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 simpatico sort of relationship between our two peoples is strong and gets stronger every year, it seems. We have many similarities 
And um, I think that'll, that'll broaden in the future and deepen, and it'll help in our, both our bilateral relationship and in our multilateral settings with NATO and e the EU. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Petric, we will conclude with you. First, let me say that I agree very much with what Ambassador Musameli has just said in a kind of humane way, uh, in a very sympathetic way, what he expressed. In addition to that, I would say that we should be aware together that the times we are entering are serious times will not be very comfortable times. That's why we should consciously work. First, for our unity, unity in Europe, unity over the Atlantic, but since we are in Slovenia, also for our unity at home. Dialogue, understanding, awareness, that democracy means convivence, living together with differences, but with a basic common interest for the nation, for the people, which can best be served if we in our country pursue dialogue and cooperation. I think we should also endeavor to be a viable ally. Look, Many European countries, years and years and years, I remember a lot of talk of European independence, defense strategy, etc., etc. But most of those countries couldn't achieve the agreement that they should pay for their security. We cannot rely years and years and years on United States. We have to be a partner but not a partner which is in a kind of position where he needs help, but when he, it is expected that it will contribute something, the readiness is not really there. Next, which I would like to say, we should work, as I said before, we should be very cautious not to make any step which would lead us towards a larger confrontation. I don't know what they are thinking in Kremlin, but one should know that many times great wars were not wished, but it occurred because of mistakes and misunderstandings. So we should be very, very, I would say, cautious, but at the same time, not accept any compromise which would mean that we have accepted the right of aggression. Aggression is something which should be outlawed for the future of our humanity, and it should be considered, as it is already considered by international and by national law, as an aggression. In this context, of course, all European countries, including Slovenia, I believe they are aware now that we have to cooperate that we have to act united, that there are challenges. We should remain open to cooperation with all those who are ready to cooperate with us, respecting the basic rules and the basic principles of the existing international order. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I would really, from the depths of my heart, like to thank all of the panelists. Um, I would characterize this the, the debate today um, for its depth, its honesty and insightfulness. Um, I'm very happy that I believe this to be the beginning of such debates and that we should continue uh, building on this. Um, I know we all are in our own positions working to strengthen our partnership. Um, I'd like to also mention the great work of the Slovenian diaspora in the United States um, that is working and the young generations that are working to enhance these relations. I also know that there's a big effort to expand the network of honorary councils. Um, and I think uh, that there's uh, bright horizons ahead as we stand together. Um, I think we all need to continue working together for democracy and the rule of law to prevail. Thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you soon um, at another debate.
Nos confirmamos.